Young Show. Hello. You know, ever since I was seven years old, there's been a particular man in my life. Dr. Walter Halloran. I remember the very first time I was taken to his office, how quickly he eased my pain and calmed my fears with his skill, his gentleness, and his understanding. And he's been doing just that ever since, God love him. Well, it's this kind of man that our story is about tonight. And now I'd like you to meet Dr. Malcolm Thomas Whitfield in our story. He lives in the small but thriving town of Yucca City. Annie Baker. Here's one, two, three, four, five house calls, September and early October. And it says here two stewing hens, and then it's marked paid in full. You know Annie Baker. She's a widow. Well, all right, so she's a widow, so you don't charge her much. The point is, Doctor, I have to report your income in dollars and cents. There's no tax rate schedule set up on stewing hens and boxes of apples and all these other things you have entered in the book. But, Dewey, some of our people don't have very much. I can't ask them for money. Well, I'm not saying you have to get tough about it. You don't have to string them up to the thumbs if they don't pay right away. It's just that I have... Wait. Now, take uh, Annie Baker, for instance. She didn't have to pay me anything. She knew that. But these two hens were cleaned and dressed. And she walked all the way in from her place, three miles to bring them here for our Sunday dinner. All right. All I'm saying, Doctor, is that you've got to get this on a business basis. Look, now here's what I mean. Now here's Annie Baker that we were talking about. at five house calls. Now let's suppose, just for the record, that, that you figure house calls at $5. Well, that's $25 here on the book. Well, if she can't pay, we'll cross it off later as a bad debt. Dewey, to save time for both of us, let me say this. I will not enter into my books that Annie Baker owes me $25 or $5 or even 10 cents. She doesn't. And the same thing goes for all those other people you asked me about. Doc, listen. You don't understand. Now, you would have to send Annie a bill as far as that goes, but it's just between Annie and you and me, and Uncle Sam. But this is just to keep the record straight. And that's my point, too. I want to keep the record straight. I don't want you or Uncle Sam or anybody else to look at my books and get the idea that Annie owes me $25. All right. I'll just do the best I can, that's all. Try to figure the fair market value on stewing him. I'm sorry, Dewey. They used to have the same kind of arguments with your father. God rest his soul. Look, I I'm sorry, but I can't understand you. Who, who is this? Oh. Uh, uh, just a minute. Dear, it's Ed Humphrey. He wants Dad to come right out. Oh, here, I'll take it. Okay. Hello, Mr. Humphrey. Uh, no, no, this is Dr. Roth. That call for me, Lynn? Uh, yes, Dad, it is. It's Ed Humphrey. He, he wants you to come right out about his wife, but why don't you let Perry take the call? You've been on the go all day, huh? Yeah. Honey, Ed Humphrey won't listen to anybody but me, and he won't even listen to me, as far as that goes. Oh, Dad. Uh, I'll take it, son. Hello, Ed. This is Doc. Hmm? All right. I'll be out there in 20 minutes. There's a bad situation out there, Perry. She needs surgery. Ed won't listen to it. Says it's not necessary. Well, then why don't you put your foot down? Tell him if he won't take your advice, he'll have to stop taking up so much of your time. Oh, Ed's all right. If you just have to understand him, that's all. Dad, how long will you be? Have you any idea? Well, I might have to take her to the hospital. Oh. That is, if I can talk Ed into it. Well, you better say goodnight to Bobby. Come on, honey, say goodnight to Grandpa. He has to be in bed in a half an hour, you know. Uh, uh, big bear hug. Goodnight, Grandpa. Uh, uh, that's fine. Good night, little man. Sleep good. I will. Thank you. 
a night of all nights. Oh, I could have told you. I know. Is it time for a Peter Pan, Daddy? It sure is. Let's go. Good night, sweetie. Hey, Daddy, wait for me. Well, come on, let's go. Dewey, he's gone. Well, you know how soon he's going to be back? Uh, he may have to take Velma Humphrey to the hospital, and if he does, we're sunk. Well, he has to come home sooner or later. I know. Look, let's get on the phone, get everybody over here while he's gone. We'll just wait him out if we have to. That's a wonderful idea. Go ahead. Oh, look, I've got something to show you. See? Oh, no, not another one. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Kemp brought it while you were in the den with Dad. Isn't it beautiful? You know, we're going to be knee-deep in birthday cakes before this night's over. <laughs> What's that now, nine? Uh, it'll be ten, counting the one your mother said she was going to bring. Lynn, I'm home. Lynn. Four and he's a jolly good fellow. 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 Happy birthday! Oh, aren't you surprised? George, this is nice. This is really nice. Almost makes me glad to have another birthday. Uh, <laughs> let's not say that, Doc. When folks get about our age, well, we just can't afford to be good sports about it. <laughs> I don't agree with you, Irene. And don't you young sprouts ever get the idea that it's a penalty to grow old? No, sir. It's an achievement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're just a whistling in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Doc. I bet you're all worn out. <laughs> oh, oh, it's all right. Oh, I was just delighted. Oh, oh, you know we're going to have ice cream and cake later. That is, we are as soon as Elmo gets here with the ice cream. Oh, that's Elmo. And you know Elmo. <laughs> I bet Doc hasn't had his supper yet. Now, why not feed him first, then we'll all have our dessert together. Would you like that, dear? Huh? Oh, no, no, honey. I'm not that oh. hungry. I'll wait for the ice cream and cake. <laughs> Oh, you'll never grow up to be a big boy like that, Doc. <laughs> no, really. I guess you got kind of used to missing meals through all these years, huh, Doc? Do you remember when Raven was born? You come seven miles through a blizzard. I remember. You never ate much that night, I bet you. <laughs> Five hours coming there and seven hours with me in labor. Five hours to get there, oh, it sure says yeah. nothing. How about the time Hank and me were trapped up in Mount Baldy? Remember that, Doc? You think I could forget it, Joe? <laughs> oh, uh, excuse me, but now I think my husband wants to say something. Oh. Terry? Uh, well, I think you all remember when I came here as Dr. Whitfield's assistant seven years ago. Well, my first consultation was on the afternoon I arrived. They brought in a young boy whose arm had been mangled in an automobile accident. Now, well, there was really only one thing to do. Amputate. I knew it, and Dr. Whitfield knew it. But as he pointed out, there was one chance in a hundred that we might be able to save the boy's arm. Well, I can truthfully say that I stood there in the operating room that day and, and witnessed a miracle. Well, it was Johnny's idea to come here and play the piano for Dr. Whitfield on his birthday. Oh. It's Johnny's way of saying thanks. Take a bow, Johnny. Oh, Johnny. Well, uh, could I have your attention a moment, please? Uh, I reckon you all know that Pete and me were on the committee to find a birthday present for Doc here for his birthday. <laughs> so we, uh, but uh, I I'd like to say this first. Uh, I guess you all know that the State Highway Department is putting a new sign at the city limits. And they've asked us to take down the old sign which has been standing there for the past 14 years just north of town. <laughs> Have you got it there? Bring it in. Now, as I recollect, 10 years ago, our population was less than 5,000, remember? Oh, I remember when it was less than 3,000. <laughs> now, there's hardly been a baby born here but what Doc Whitfield has delivered it. There's a lot of us alive today that wouldn't be alive if it hadn't been for Doc. So Pete and me, we went to Mr. McTavish, and we had him make us a, a little extra sign. And we figured to give that to Doc for his birthday present. Oh. All right, Joey, bring her on. Yeah. Thanks to Dr. M. Whitfield. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Take a seat. Please, please. Uh, thanks to you, Joe, and to Pete, and to all the rest of you. Uh, I don't exactly know what to say. <laughs> uh, huh? Could you come here? Oh, excuse me just a minute. It was Ed Humphrey. His wife has begun to hemorrhage pretty badly. I told him that he had to get it into the hospital, that we'd be there by the time she arrives. That's what I've been dreading. You better come along with me, son. chance in a hundred deals. You don't win consistently against odds like that. You want me to go and tell Ed? He's waiting down the hall. No, no. I'll do it. There's one thing I have never learned in all my years of practice. What's the merciful way to tell a man his wife has just died? How is she, Doc? Sit down, Ed. I want to talk to you. You know, sometimes things we plan don't exactly work out. Sometimes they're taken out of our hands. And then we have to start... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. She's dead, ain't she? We did everything we could, but it was too late. You murderer! No. You'll pay for this! No, Ed. Yes, you will! No. You know, after the party, you can imagine how many cakes we had left over. But Dad always asked for a piece of your banana cake. Oh, bless his soul. He's <laughs> such a sweet one. Oh, that is. And now this Ed Humphrey trying to make trouble. Think that's anything to worry about? Well, I tell you, Lynn, I get so mad at that Ed Humphrey that I could just scratch his eyes out. Him, of all people, why, the very idea. Yeah, well, Dad says it's just a reaction. Naturally, Mr. Humphreys would be upset after losing his wife and that we shouldn't blame him. Well, whose fault was it that Velma Humphrey died? I ask you that. It was Ed's fault, and everybody knows that. Why, he wouldn't even let your pa operate when he wanted to. No, I know. Said he was again in hospitals. <laughs> Ed Humphrey. <laughs> Well, him now trying to bring a lawsuit against your pa? You better not let me get on that jury. I can tell him that. Well, it may never come to trial. Yet. Well, if it does, all I wish for is to get on that jury. That's all I wish for. Oh, come on. Let's talk about something else. Oh, now. well, I just can't think about anything else right now. How about another piece of cake? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't understand why you would try such a thing in the first place. Hey, you must learn to make allowances, my dear. You see, people get upset, and they do things they wouldn't do ordinarily. I know, I know, Dad, but this I don't understand. I mean, surely he must know that he's responsible for his wife's death. No, he doesn't. Well, how could he not know it? Because he can't force himself to face the truth, that's all. Oh, so he blames you. Dragging him into court, charging malpractice. Poor thing. He must have been upset. I'll get it, dear. Yes? Mr. Humphrey. I want to see Doc Whitfield. Where's he at? What is it you want to see him about? I want to see your pa. Him and me got something to talk over. Oh, please, leave my father alone, will you? You had your chance in court and it was all What do you mean out. I had my chance? It's all a big frame-up. They threw my case out before I had a chance to talk. Mr. Humphrey, I don't understand you. What's gotten into you? Well, you don't even make any sense. Oh, look, I've known you ever since I was a little girl. Lynn, where's your pa? Oh, Ed. I thought I heard your voice out here. I want to talk to you, Doc. 
good, good. I was hoping you'd come and have a talk with me. Uh, go on in here. We can have a nice long talk. Won't take me long to say what I'm going to say. Dad. I won't be a minute, dear. Dr. Roth, please. Perry, it, it, it's Lynn. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, when do you think you'll be home? <laughs> no, it isn't that, but... Perry, look. Ed Humphrey just came to the house. And he's in the den with Dad right now. Perry, he looks so strange. I don't trust him. <gasps> Dad! 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 Oh, no! Doc Whitfield. It was Ed Humphrey shot him. Lynn was right there in the house. So they catch him, and he pleads temporary insanity. <laughs> well, I just don't think that's right. It's deliberate cold-blooded murder, that's what it is. This time's to talk and time's to act. And this here is a time to act. We're all meeting back at Wampler's store. There's enough of us out beating the bushes. How's he going to get away? You know how everyone in this town felt about your father. It's a dangerous situation, Lynn. They're all gathering behind Wampler's store. Uh -huh. I tell you, it, it's getting to be an unruly mob. Oh, look. I've tried to talk to them, but they won't listen to me. They would listen to you. For heaven's sake, Perry, haven't you got any feeling at all? This man killed my father. He shot him down in cold blood. And now you're asking me to go down there and tell those men it's all right? Oh, Lynn, would you please listen to me? Oh, Perry. There's something ugly going to happen in this town if that mob isn't stopped. What do you mean there's something ugly going to happen? Something ugly has already happened. Oh, Lynn. Your father was a fine, decent man. This is no fitting tribute to his memory, this, this mass hysteria. Well, if you ask my opinion, I think they have a right to be hysterical. And I, for one, am very glad that they are. Oh, honey, please, don't talk like that. You don't need it. You're, you're just upset. Upset? I'm just sick with the uselessness of this whole horrible tragedy. All right. I'm going back down there now and try to talk to those men. Try to reason with them. Do you want me to stop by and bring Bobby home when I come back today? No, no, I, I don't want him in this house, not until after the funeral. It's... Well, he said he was going down to Wampler's store. Oh. But, well, then maybe you better try the hospital. I know he has an appointment there this afternoon. Yeah. Yes, of course, if he does come back, I'll have him call you, Ms. Pendleton. Well, yes. Yes, certainly. Thanks very much, but I'd really rather not talk about it now, if you don't mind. Yes. Get in here, Lynn. Mr. Humphrey. What are you doing here? I'm gonna hide here. It's the last place they'd look. And they're looking for me, you know. Yes, I know. Get over there and be quiet. Get over there! Is that my father's gun you got? Yeah, and it's loaded. Now, Mr. Humphrey, that... Shut up. Shut up, listen. They're getting closer. Yes. Sounds like they're coming right here. All right, Lynn. 
I'm going to stand here in this doorway, see? And I'm going to have this gun aimed right square at your back. I want no funny business. I don't know what you mean. Now, you get out there and open that front door. Tell them I'm not here and you ain't seen me. I'll get me plenty of them if you tell them I'm here after I get you. Now, get out there. Get out there, can't you hear him? I can hear him. And don't forget, I'll be standing right here with this gun aimed square at your back. Yeah. Lynn, you haven't seen Ed Humphrey around here, have you? Look, somebody said they saw him in the neighborhood. Lynn, we're going to find that dirty rat. And when we do, he's going to curse the day he was born. I give you my word, Lynn. When we find him, I'm going to kill him. With my bare hands, I'm going to kill him. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to him when he starts to beg. I'm going to look him right in the eye and laugh in his face. That dirty skunk. The last thing he's going to hear is me laughing at him. Johnny, what's happened? Lynn, you didn't tell us. Have you seen him? No. All right. Come on, fellas. Come on. Come on. Played it real smart, Lynn. Real smart. How could they change so? Good thing you didn't try no funny business. I could have got two of them. Maybe three. No, you couldn't. You couldn't have shot anybody. That gun won't fire. Yes, it will. It's loaded. I tried to tell you before, Mr. Humphrey. My father took the firing pin out of that rifle the day Bobby was born. Why didn't you tell them I were here if you know there weren't no firing pin? Because I... I saw the same hate in their eyes as I saw in yours. And it didn't look any better on them than it looks on you. You know it all the time I couldn't fire the gun. You know it all the time. You could have told them I were here and there weren't nothing I could do about it. But you didn't tell them. I never thought you'd be the one to help me. I'm not helping you. But I'm trying to help those men. I'm trying to keep them from doing something they'll be sorry for for the rest of their lives. They're good, decent men ordinarily. They're not mean. They're not cruel. I want you to call the sheriff and tell him to come out here and get you right now. The sheriff, you think I'm crazy? I won't do it. I won't. You call him or I'm going to scream for that mob to come back in here. No, I haven't even got a gun. They killed me. They tear me to pieces. I know they would. I know it. That's why you've got to call the sheriff. At least you'll get protection from him. You'll have a fair trial. No, no I can't. Please, listen to him out there. It's got to be one thing or the other. Now, either I scream for them to come in here or you call the sheriff. Hey, fellas, maybe he's over here. This is Ed Humphrey. Get me the sheriff. I wonder which of us would dare to say this prayer at night. Oh, Lord, treat me tomorrow as I have treated others today. Well, good night. See you next week.